Judges 13. You guys are helping me preach this morning. I appreciate it. I need the help. I do. I need the help. Y'all pray for me. Judges chapter 13. I mentioned last Sunday God had been working a message in me as we were coming home last Sunday or last uh, last Friday from Bible camp. And uh, the it, God unfolded the message in front of me there uh, because of a flat tire in Sullivan, Missouri. And uh, by the way, I was able to reach out with uh, Andrew, who I preached about last Sunday, and uh, I sent him the link uh, to last Sunday morning's uh, sermon. And uh, so he, he, he acknowledged it this morning, said he got the link and he appreciated it. And you continue to pray for him. Uh, and I had said that I, I may, I may um, do a, a sort of a series on the life of Samson uh, from the Bible. And as I began to study this out, I really, really struggled with whether or not that was what I was supposed to do. In fact, I mean, it was getting down to the wire last night. Um, and I still was not settled on what to preach. And uh, I prayed for a while and studied for a while and prayed for a while and studied for a while. And then uh, finally God gave me a, a piece of a message uh, last night. And I put some of the notes together, the scriptures and so on. And then um, this morning, um, after we got here, God gave me one more verse to, to, to make it all click together. And when he did that, and when I thought about how it fits in with what I'm going to share with you this morning. It just, in my mind, it clicked. Now, my problem is today is I, I kind of struggled through Sunday school, uh, keeping on a, on a straight and narrow course through the lesson. And I want to be able to do that this morning with you so as not to bring any confusion or any doubt into anybody's mind. And I want you to understand that the very plain and simple meaning of what God's Word has to say to us this morning. But it ha does have to do with Samson. And something that the angel of the Lord told uh, Samson's mother and his father on how he was supposed to live. Judges chapter 13 verse 2. And there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now, just for a moment, I want you to think in your mind, how many women in the Bible had this same problem? Isn't that something? That you have a repeating theme all through the Bible. You have a woman that, that wants to bear a child. She wants to bring forth fruit. She wants a child. She wants to be a blessing to her husband. She does not want to be the reproach among the women. She wants to be like the other women and had the fulfillment and satisfaction of bearing a child. And I'll tell you something. God is, I believe God has put it in the heart of a woman to want to have a child and to hold their own child. Do you believe that? Say amen. I remember when my wife brought it up to me about when we were going to start having children. And she said, you know, I'm not getting any younger. She's 23. She said, I'm going to be old next year. It's okay. But uh, anyway, she wanted to hold that baby. And um, I, it just I, I, it boggles my mind when you have all these women protesting the Supreme Court saying, I want to kill my baby. I don't want to hold no baby. I want to kill my baby. That makes me sick. And it makes me mad. Somebody say amen. It goes against the Lord, against the Bible. But anyway, the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware. Now watch this now. This is the theme. I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Remember last Sunday morning we preached on saviors. God raised him up, saviors, to save people, and, and Samson is one of those saviors. But God gave a specific instruction for Samson and to his mother that the whole time she was pregnant, she was not to drink any wine or strong drink, 
nor to eat anything that was unclean. And that falls in line with what the Nazarite vow is, and I'm going to show you that in a moment. But she was to follow basically the same rules that under a Nazarite vow, and what it means is she was to separate herself uh, and not be like the rest of the family, not be like the rest of the world. Now, that's where I'm going with this this morning. And then he said, when the child is born, there'll be no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. He shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So what that meant was that Samson was to never, ever shave his beard, his mustache. Uh, he wasn't to... Uh, uh, boy, now, I know it's kind of gross. He was to never pluck the hair out of his ears. Ugh. He was to never cut his hair, nor shave his hair, nor his whiskers, nor anything like that. Samson, if you think about it, was a weird, woolly, nasty-looking, hippie-type thing. Okay? Now, just in case you've read this verse wrong, and I've had people tell me this. Oh, I don't believe that was from God. God, God said it's a, it's a sin for a man to have long hair. No, the Bible didn't say that. The Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Doth not nature itself teach it's a shame for a man to have long hair. And what that means is, in this case, is that Samson is a type of Christ and he is bearing our shame and our reproach, when, when people looked on Samson, he was different than everybody else because of the hair. Can you imagine how much hair this guy had after 20, 30 years of life, having never cut his hair one time? Big, nasty thing coming out of his head. But anyway, that's, that was what was to happen. Now in verse 6, the Bible says, Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. Very terrible. By the way, who was this angel? Who was it? Anybody want to guess? Let's read the text. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told me his name. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink. <clears throat> Excuse me, neither eat any unclean thing. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Now, this is not in my notes, but if you look down toward the end of, um, of chapter 13, in verse 21, the Bible says, But the angel of the Lord, who is the angel of the Lord? He did not appear, and did no more appear to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto his wife, We shall surely die because we have seen who? Who was that? That was Christ. Isn't that something that Christ is bringing forth into this world a man who is to be a shadow of Jesus Christ? Well, I just think that's neat. I think that's something. But anyway, the Bible says, Behold, thou shalt conceive, verse 7 again, of Judges 13, Thou shalt conceive and bear a son, now drink no wine, no strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of of his death. Now, go back to Numbers chapter 6, if you would. Numbers chapter 6. This is the introductory part of it. I'm trying to move through this, and I want to get to the meat of the subject so that I can roll on. And that way, if God wants me to stop and add more verses to the text, well, then I've got time to do it. Amen. What is my biggest fear while I'm preaching? I'm going to run out of Bible verses. I don't ever, ever, ever want to, I don't ever, ever, ever want to have to cut a sermon short because I didn't study enough. Amen. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Numbers chapter 6. Here's what the Bible, what the Bible calls a Nazarite vow. Now, a Nazarite vow, there was, it, there was actually no commandment from scriptures of someone who wanted to take a Nazarite vow, there was no commandment in the scriptures that they had to do it for life, or if they did it, they had to do it for like 10 years, or they had to do it for five years, or six months, or whatever. If you were to take a Nazarite vow, you are the one who set the time limit that you were going to take that vow. 
Or if God, you know, somehow spoke to you and led you and said, I want you to be a Nazarite for 10 years or five years or whatever, then you would do that and you would fulfill that. But basically, the oath was yours. And what you were saying, now listen to this now, this was, this was voluntary. When you presented yourself to God and said, God, I'm going to take the vow of a Nazarite, that was your choice. You were saying to God, God, I want to be set apart. God, I want to be different than everybody else in this world. God, I want to be unique. Not that I want to, everybody to be looking at me and thinking, oh, he's some kind of real holy man. That's not what I want because, like I said, those men never cut their hair. That was a shame and a reproach. And even nature tells us that, doesn't it, men? I've always liked short hair. I grew up in the 70s. When all the boys and all the teen boys was growing their hair long, I didn't like long hair, didn't like it then, don't like it now. I like my hair short. Okay? And it's getting shorter every year. Seems like. But this was something that people, when they went to God, said, God, this is what I want to do. This is how long I'm going to do it. And God expected them, and they expected themselves to do it for that amount of time. Look at what the Bible says in verse 1, Numbers chapter 6. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to, a vow, to vow a vow of a Nazarite, notice this, this is what I have underlined, to separate themselves unto the Lord. You can expect this morning a message on biblical separation. Biblical separation. The Bible says in verse 3, He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. That means you're not going to the bars. That means you're going to dump all the liquor out of your liquor cabinet. You're going to dump all the beer out and throw it away, especially if it's got that sodomite queer on the can of it. Amen! Lisa, we were out shopping Friday, and I don't know what caught her eye, but Lisa, we got in the car, and Lisa said, man, they're practically giving Bud Light away in there. That was a stupid, that, that is worse than new Coke. Amen. All right. I'll get back to the scriptures now. Verse 3, he shall separate himself from wine and from strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. That means no grapes, no raisins, nothing. No raisin bran, nothing. Verse 4, all the days of his separation, there it is, says it again, shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his head, until the days be fulfilled in the which he separateth himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy, and let the locks of the hair of his head grow. And, and so the Bible, here again, the Bible's telling you, there's no definite time. For most people who took a Nazarite vow, there's no definite separation time. It was completely up to them. But it was sort of the idea that if you said to God, God, I'm going to set myself aside now for one year. And for one year, I'm not going to put a razor to my head. I'm not going to drink uh, any wine, even any grape juice, eat any raisins. I'm not going to touch dead things. I'm going to stay away from those things then that's what you did for a year. You were expected that since you're the one who made the oath to God, it was expected that you ought to be grown up enough to fulfill the oath. Can I get an amen out of somebody? Why is it we live in a world now where grown-ups do not know what it means to make a promise and keep it anymore? That's how wicked this world has gotten. That's how sinful this world has gotten. That's how uh, covetous this world has gotten men are in fact one of the signs of the last days that men shall be was it truce breakers oath breakers covenant breakers something like that that means they'll go around making promises to everybody and not fulfill them well this was on you and so um 
In verse 6, all the days that he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. He shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his brother or for his sister when they die, because the consecration of his God is upon his head. All the days of his separation, watch this, here's that separation again. All the days of his separation, he is holy unto the Lord. And God was saying here that if your, if your husband or your dad died, while you were separated as a Nazarite, you could not participate in the funeral. And it was to be understood by all Israel that you had taken an oath before God of a Nazarite. You'd taken a Nazarite vow. And I guess everybody understood that if daddy dies or grandpa dies and, and you're still under that oath, that we cannot ask you to participate, nor can we allow you to participate, because by doing that, we ourselves would be guilty of causing you to be breaking that oath that you made before God. And so, the whole idea about the oath of the Nazarite was that he was to be separate. He was to be different from this world. And I'm going to ask you a question this morning. If God has called us out to be His peculiar people, His peculiar treasure, does God call us, as some believe, to be part of this world and to act like the world and to live like the world and to go along with the world in the hopes that the world will like us enough so that maybe we can win them over to some sort of Jesus idea that we give to them or does God draw a line and say, come over to this side here. This is where I am. This is where my word is. This is where the church is. This is where holiness is. You come over here. If you're going to, if you're going to be one of mine, then you've got to decide which side of the line you're going to live on. You cannot straddle the fence. So now I've got it up here and I'm going to have, I don't know how any other way to do this other than do this. But let's go to the Lord in prayer and then I'm going to ask you to help me preach this, all right? Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd bless this message. Lord, help us, help us to preach it, Father, and help, help me, Lord, with uh, my mind and not being able to say everything quite right today. And Lord, I just pray, God, that you would bless. So through my weakness, Lord, would you be strong today in the hearts and minds of these people? They need it. I need it. And Father, teach us and open our eyes and show us ways, dear God, that we're compromising with what's going on in this world. Father, when we should be taking a stand, not being mean, not being ignorant about it, not being hateful to everybody, but Father, just taking a gentle stand and saying to this lost world, I'm not going to proceed any further with you. This is where I get off. I can't go any further. My God has separated me out and made me different. And this is the way I'm going to be. Father, give us boldness. Give us love in our hearts. But Lord, teach us how to be separate and a different, peculiar people from the way this world is going. We ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. If you would look up on the screen there, I'm going to ask you to help me with this uh, and turn, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. There's, a, there's another verse God's added to the message. Say, Amen. Oh, Pastor Mike, we love it when you add to the message. Hey, Amen. That means we get to stay in church longer. JR, would you get me another one of these, please? I drank all that first one. You didn't, you didn't get it right. It's all gone now. Ephesians chapter 2, very, very quickly, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. You've heard me preach this many times. The world is on a course. It has a way about it. Okay? According to the prince of the power of the air. So the way that this world is going is being led by Satan himself. He's the one responsible for the wickedness that exists in our country. He's the one responsible for the wickedness that exists inside, inside now, what we're, we're known as Bible-believing churches. The devil is the one responsible for the wickedness inside those churches. And what you have is you have people 
who've got one foot on the, on the ground of the cross and one foot in hell, and they don't want to move from that position because they want it both ways. They want the ways of this world. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. They, they want the ways of this world, but they do, they, they do not want God uh, exhibited in their life uh, and, them, and them living their lives according to the ways of God. They want to go to heaven, but they want to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And God said, that's not possible. It's not possible. So at one time, we walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. But now, uh, which belongs to the children of disobedience, but now we have our conversation in God. So we're not like that anymore, or we're not supposed to be like that anymore. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I've got two boxes up here. And on one box is the way that righteous people ought to live. And then over here in this box, the way that lost people, this is the world. This is the way that lost people live. This is what they do. These are the things that they do that are wrong, not according to our church, not according to our thinking, but they're wrong according to the Bible. So I'm going to have you help me fill this in. Somebody give me uh, an attribute now of what you think a Christian person ought to be like in their daily life. Who? Hardworking. You know what? That's scriptural. Hang on. Hard working. Forgiving. Give me another one. Truth. Always telling the truth. Right? Whose truth? Give me another one. Loving. Give me another one. Humble. That means we don't have church pride parades. Amen. Give me another one. Meekness, that's humble. Patient. Thankful. Faithful. Prayerful. How about this one? Nobody's getting nobody's getting this one. Holy. Holy. Having Christ's righteousness. How about that? Yes. Content. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, let's go over here to the world. Tell me how lost people are. Not how they're supposed to be, but how they are. Okay? Deceitful. I before E except after C. Or when sounding like A is in neighbor and way. There we go. Huh? They're liars. Is that true? Mur Spell that M R M R M R M R S. Huh? Prideful. That's the opposite of meekness. Empty. Okay, we'll put down covetousness. Hang on, no, 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 no. Okay, drunk, drunkards, jealous, well, God's jealous, hope, what'd you have, murderers, thank you, hey, how about, how about, murder, 
murder or something, whatever. How about this? Adulterers. Rebellious. Can I, I want to tell you something. A guy had been trying to call me all week. And don't worry, I'm not going to try to finish out my notes today. A guy had been trying to call me all week this week. Now, he and I are friends with the same person, so it kind of, it kind of threw me. But when he, when he finally, when he, I finally got some free time and I think, okay, I'll talk to him. He called and he said he's, he's, he stumbled onto something that's going to change everything. He said it's going to change this world. It's going to change the way Christianity is seen in this world. And he said, in fact, it's just, it's the fix for everything. And he said, if we get enough people to do it this way, then it, it'll solve all the problems. We will, we will correct everything wrong in this nation. And I said, okay, what is it you're talking about? And I'm not going to get into all the, the uh, things that he said, but basically he is what they would know, are, is known as a sovereign citizen. He believes that uh, when you are born, they take your birth certificate, and since they type your name in all capital letters, that means that you are now collateral that the government uses to make money off of you, and, that, that, and you are a, uh, uh, some kind of slave of the state, and that you can fill out some paperwork and send it into the attorney general, and that makes you no longer a citizen of the United States, which means that you're not under any law enforcement agency's jurisdiction. You do not have to have, you, and this is what he said, you don't have to have a driver's license to drive. You don't have to have inspection stickers on your cars. You don't need car tags on your cars. You don't need insurance. And uh, you don't have to pay taxes to the IRS. And you don't have to do this and you don't have to do that. Now, I've been watching these sovereign citizens on YouTube for years. And I know, what they, I know how they think and I know what they are. And I want to tell you something. A lot of them are dangerous people. And I told him on the phone, I said, well, let me tell you what you're doing. I said, you're practicing witchcraft. He said, huh? I said, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. I said, you set yourself up as an anarchist. You believe that nobody in this world has authority over you, but God, I said, but God clearly says in Romans chapter 13 that God is the one who ordains higher powers over mankind. Amen. Amen. Then that man, he honestly believed, he, what, what he did was he watched some stupid YouTube videos. Do not get your theology from YouTube. Get it from the Bible, Amen. So now, look at this list here. All the things that the world is, you and I are not supposed to be. Uh, let, me, let me put another one here. That means we're not supposed to be that. We're not supposed to favor that. We're not supposed to companion that. We're not supposed to go along with that. You know what that is? Every one of these things on this list is a sin that will condemn a man's soul to the lake of fire for eternity. In fact, if you don't believe that, turn to um, Galatians, if you would. Galatians. Chapter 5. Cotton mouth day. Got a dry mouth. So watch this. <clears throat> In Galatians 5, he gives, there's a contrast here. He gives the nine fruits of the Spirit. Before that, he gives the 18 works of the flesh. That's nine times two, by the way. So he says uh, in verse 17 of Galatians 5, For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. Notice this list. These lists are contrary one to the other. You cannot say that you're one if you are both. Amen? So that you cannot do the things that you would. 
But if you be led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. And every one of those letters, LGBTQ+, plus, and I'll just put in here A for adulterers, F for fornicators, L for lascivious, well, there's another L up there. L for lascivious. Every one of those things are works of the flesh and they will condemn a man's soul to the lake of fire. Idolatry, witchcraft, and rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Uh, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings and such like of the which I tell you before as I have also told you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God now God calls us to be one of these but never both of these if God calls you to be holy Prayerful, faithful, humble, loving, having on Christ's righteousness, so on and so on, filled with the Holy Spirit of God. If God has called you to be that, then what He has also called you to do is to come out away from those who are deceitful, liars, murmurers, prideful, empty, covetousness, drunkards, murderers, adulterers, rebellious, and so on. That means you've got to pick one or the other, but you cannot have it both ways. Now, let me get back to the deal here. In Genesis 25, verse 23, the Lord said unto her, this is uh, Rachel, I believe. He said, two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of, not Rachel, um, Rebecca. Two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. Notice that they are separated. One son was not like the other son. God chose one of the sons the Bible says clearly that God hated the other son. They shall be separated from thy bowels. The one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the elder shall serve the younger. But God clearly separated them. And did, did watch this now. For, for, those of you, for those of you who might be listening or might be sitting here and saying, Well, it doesn't matter how we look on the outside. God looks on the inside. It doesn't matter how we dress up the outside which has given rise for everybody in, the, everybody in churches all over the world, tattoo themselves, pierce themselves all over the place, dress like the world, act like the world, live like the world, while they try to tell you, well, God doesn't look on the outside. Well, let me ask you a question. When you saw uh, Jacob and Esau standing together next to each other when they was about 20 years old, could you tell the difference between them? Just like that. God made Jacob one way. God made Esau another way. And it was, in fact, Jacob had to go in dressed and covered like Esau to pretend that he was Esau, didn't he? God clearly and distinctively made them look differently than everybody else. Leviticus 20, 24, I have said unto you, ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. One of the biggest problems that we have, and I, I'm going to say probably the biggest problem that we have, not, not just in this country, but I would get specific about it, and I would say in in churchology in general is that so many churches have adopted the idea that how we live and how we look and how we appear and how we carry on ourselves does not really matter to God and it does not matter to the world that we can live however we want to and live in alternative lifestyles including LGBTQ plus and that God will still accept that God will welcome that the church should accept it the church should welcome it 
And as I was talking to you about a few weeks ago, even the former denomination that we used to belong to now is beginning to embrace transgenderism, LGBTQ. Had we not separated ourselves from that denomination some years ago, we would have done it now. I guarantee you. When the two angels went in to visit Lot, to warn Lot that destruction was coming to Sodom, did the angel say to Lot and to his family, uh, dig a basement and stay here in Sodom and you'll be all right? What did God do? Led them out. Come out of her, my people, God says. God, if God does anything for you in your life and you want to listen, you want the milk and honey. You don't want the separation from this world. You say to God, I will listen to the music I want to listen to. I will watch the movies I want to watch. I will watch. I will look at the things on the Internet that I that I lust after and I want to lust after and look after. And I will I will uh Step out on my marriage and I will drink what I want. I will take what I want. I will sleep with what I want. I will say what I want. And you can't. And I don't want anybody telling me that I can't. But I still want the milk and honey that goes along with going to heaven. And God says you can't have it. In Ezra chapter 9. Now I want to, see, I want to show you how serious God was about this. And how, how seriously the Jews took it. Ezra and Nehemiah are the two books that are written after they came out of Babylonian captivity. And the, and the Israelites were hungry for the ways of God back in their life. They wanted to build the temple again. They wanted to build the walls around Jerusalem again. They were zealous about it. They wanted Ezra to teach them the old ways. So in Ezra 9 verse 1, Now when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. Verse 2, For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. Boy, I tell you what, I could preach a whole message on just that. How the problems in the churches in this country right now are generally to be laid at the feet of the pastors of those churches. The chief of those churches are their chief in this trespass. They're the ones who started this mess. Leading everybody away from the word of God. Mingling the word of God in their preaching with uh, philosophies and ideas that come from God knows where have nothing to do with the Bible whatsoever, and yet they've mingled that into their preaching and people have bought into it. That goes all the way, turn to Deuteronomy 7. I want to show you where that comes from. Yeah, Deuteronomy 7. And you're going to be surprised at what the Israelites did. If you don't know this story, you're going to be surprised. Deuteronomy 7 verse 1, when the Lord thy God shall, this is a commandment that God made. When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt not smite them, or thou shalt smite them. And utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them. Nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make what? Marriages. I've been in church all my life. And my sister and I and Lisa. And we had good teaching. When we were here. And. All of us young people were warned. When you go to get married. 
Make sure you marry somebody that is equal with you in their faith. How wise is that? Does it create problems when you marry someone who does not have, is not equal with you in faith? Now, it's not an unforgivable, unpardonable sin, but it has problems. It certainly does. And what we're seeing happen is moms and dads are trying to raise their children the right way, teach them the right way, teach them God's way, teach them holy living, clean life. And then some Jezebel or some wolf will come and take them away. And that is exactly what God said here. He said, verse 3, Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me. That they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. So back here in Ezra, that was what they were complaining about. That the Israelite men had taken daughters of the Canaanites and the Amorites and the Ammonites and all those women... And married into their families. And now they're compromised. And you know what compromises them the most? The grandchildren. Grandchildren. Our hearts get easily tugged by our grandchildren, don't they? Oh, my grandchildren. Oh, I'd do anything for my grandchild. Oh, People, you got to be careful. Uh, listen, I believe in loving grandchildren. I believe in, in giving them... Uh, listen, that, I'd give them all that whole box of candy today. Turn them loose to their parents. <laughs> Eat up, children. I want to be grandpa of the year. I want them to like me. I want them to love me. I want them to have good memories of me long after I'm long gone. But one thing I cannot do is sell out my faith and sell out my stand for my grandchildren. I can't do it. And I fear for my grandchildren and the world that they're coming up in. But that's what happened. They, they took daughters out of the... See, and God was trying to keep a pure bloodline. God's not a racist. But he was trying to, in Israel to keep a pure bloodline. Partially for the tribe of Judah. So that Christ could be born of the pure line of Judah. But they have mingled the holy seed with the people of that land. And so God gave the commandment back in Deuteronomy not to do that. So here's what they did. In Nehemiah, the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. You know what they ended up doing? All of those strange women that the Israelites married, they divorced them and put them away. Didn't they? You ever read that story? Every one of them divorced and put away their wives who were not Jewish women. Now, I'll tell you something. That's a big deal to do. But that's the kind of stuff that revival will bring to the heart of a man or a woman. Is that they'll be willing to say, I'm going to stand for God. And if you don't stand with me, there's nothing I can do about it. Amen. Now, let's see here. I'm going to do two more verses here. And then I'm going to get to, I'm going to, get to the end of it. Turn to 2 Corinthians 6. And then turn to um, Hebrews 10. 2 Corinthians 6, Hebrews 10. <clears throat> The verse that God gave me this morning that kind of ties everything together. I mean, it just to me, it just really hit home. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, that doesn't just mean in marriage. 
I'd say that also means in business as well. How would you like to start a business and have a partner and then find out your partner's lost, but you're saved? Is your partner in that business going to do things God's way all the time? No. Nope. And it's automatically unequal because you're going to do, want to do things that are right. You're going to say, you know what? The IRS is going to get us if we don't do it this way. And the lost man's going to say, well, there's ways around the IRS. We don't have to do that. The IRS, they won't catch us. Well, you're being dishonest then. You're not providing things honest in the sight of men. Being not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That means don't join clubs or organizations or secret societies who's, who are not dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ and His Word. Somebody say, Amen. You want, you want to get involved? Get in a local church and get involved. Amen. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? The answer is none. And what communion hath light with darkness? On day one when God created light, the Bible says God separated the light from darkness. The two of them are not the same. And by the way, a male is not also a female. And a female is not also a male. Amen. They are different. They are not the same. You can't just say one day I'm going to be a woman. Next day I'm going to be a man. Next day I'm not going to be either one of them. Next day I'm going to be both of them. That's the spirit of this world and you should have no part of it. And yet there are churches now that have people who are of that mindset Helping out, working in the children's department, up on the stage in the praise band, doing all kinds of things inside the church. God is not in that place. That's Ichabod. Amen. What communion hath light with darkness? Or what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? That means that there's a reason why I am not a member of the ministerial fellowship in this town. I cannot fellowship with men who bow before idols and teach others that they must also bow before idols. I cannot fellowship with them. I cannot go along with them. I cannot be part with them. I don't care what great work they're doing. I can't have any part of it. God calls us to be separate from that nonsense. Um... For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye, what? Separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, there is a promise here, but that promise only applies to those who want to be separate. Who don't want to go along the ways of the world. Who don't want to follow after the pattern of what's going on in this world. Who stand against the wickedness that's in our schools. The wickedness that's in our government. The wickedness that's in our corporations. The wickedness that is in our organizations. The wickedness that is in churches. They stand against that. And they will not be a part of it. And then this one. Look at this. Nope. What did I say? Hebrews 10. This is who we're not supposed to be part of. Hebrews 10, 38. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So I was talking to a pastor there while we were at Bible camp. Brother Mike Hutzel about this deal going on in the denomination about how they're, have, they're, they're, they've blurred the lines now when it comes to the sodomy issue, the LGBTQ plus issue, and so on. They've blurred the lines, and what it is, it's money. They know that there are wealthy, powerful families within that denomination that give large amounts of money, and they know they probably have sodomites in their family, and because they don't want anybody saying anything against their children or their grandchildren because then if they do, they'll pull the money out and they'll go to some other denomination or some other church and put their money in there and they don't want to lose that money. So 
we were talking about that and what they, what they are recommending now, if, if we were still part of that denomination, they recommended to us that we affiliate ourselves with transgendered men, that we invite them to play games, that we invite them over to dinner, that we invite them to go out to movies with us. Now I'm talking about you and watch this. I'm talking about you and your family. Let's say, let's say Megan, you and Bub, are going to go out. You, there's two men that you know, and they both dress up like women. They both wear wigs. They wear makeup. They're the ugliest sight you've ever seen in your life. And they want you to fix their hair for them. So they come in, and, and the denomination says that you're going to invite those two men over to your house with your son. Don't do it. And I said, I said, Mike, I said, here's how I see it. God drew a line. And on this side, he's called us who were over here. He's called us to come to be with him over here. Does that sound right? He's called us to be on his side, not us saying, God, you be on our side. We be on God's side. And then all the lost people's over here. Now, the invitation of the gospel is not that we cross over and be a bridge for everybody, but that we, still standing where God told us to stand, invite all of those who are weary, who are worn, whose sin uh, has, has destroyed their lives, and they have nothing left, and, and they're about ready to end their life and us to reach over to them and say, would you like to come over here where there's some life, where there's some joy, where there's redemption, where there's forgiveness, where there is really true love. Would you like to come over here and be with us? Because this train is going to glory one of these days. That's how it's supposed to be done. Separate. God made us peculiar people, he says in 1 Peter. Different than everybody else. So while the school teachers and the school board and all the politicians want to cave in to all that garbage, we're not caving in. We're not giving in. We're not giving up. We're going to stand. And if they tell us that we can't say anything about it, that's the first thing we're going to do is say something about it. We can't compromise any more people. We've already given up so much. We've already lost so much. And there just really isn't any more room for compromise. God separated Samson out so that he could save many. How would you like for God to use you to save many people's lives? And I know what I'm talking about. I used to have a worldly streak in me. It was bad. And the only way God could use me is, Mike, I'm going to, I'm going to drive that out of you so that now I can use you. Let's bow our heads. If you're here this morning, you want to come and pray down on one of these benches, you're more than welcome to. I'm going to give you that time. Father, I come before you this morning and I thank you, God, for the message. I thank you, God, for speaking to my heart and dealing to my heart. And Father, I thank you, Lord, for this last verse here. God, that you made us of the people who don't draw back. We're, we're, we're the people, Lord, who are not going to leave. We're not going to go back to Egypt. We're not going to turn back to the life that we left. We're not giving up. Now, Lord, sometimes I feel like giving up. Sometimes I feel like quitting. Sometimes I feel like walking back. But God, you've always been there for me. You've always held me close. You've done what's been needed in my life, and I thank you for it. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would speak to the hearts of these people today. 
And deal with each one of them, Lord, however, Lord, they need to be dealt with. And whatever issue in life, Lord, they're compromising with. God, would you change them? Help us, Father, to see that we are on your side. And that it is our job to call sinners over to join with us, not the other way around. So God, make us holy. Make us clean. Make us right. Make us perfect in your sight. And help us, dear God, with love to beg and plead those who are on the other side to come join us. Where there's a lot of love to pass around and a lot of joy to give out. A lot of happiness to share. And one of these days we'll be home with you. Because we didn't compromise. Father, bless your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said... Amen. Would you stand to your feet, please?